Today I am so excited to see so many new faces here in our worship space. If you are here for the first time, we want you to know we, we are here for you. We've been planning for you. We've been praying for you. And we're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. Before we stand for the reading of Scripture, I want you to dig into your wallet or your purse, any cash that you have, unless you have like 10 $100 bills, I want you to put that in the basket in the back for our youth mission trip, their immersion trip. We have young students in our church that care about making a difference in our community and in our world. You need to support them. So join me in taking whatever cash you've got, drop it in the basket out there in our foyer, and this is a way to support them as they grow and lead us in learning how to serve somebody. This time I invite you to stand as you are able for the reading of God's Word. We have two scriptures this morning we want to read. The first comes from Matthew chapter 23, starting with verse 13. These are all the red-lettered words of Jesus. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You shut the door of the kingdom of heaven in people's faces. You yourselves do not enter, nor will you let those enter who are trying to. Woe to you, teachers of the law and Pharisees, you hypocrites. You travel over land and sea to win a single convert. And when you have succeeded, you have made them twice as much a child of hell as you are. Woe to you, blind guides. You say, if anyone swears by the temple, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gold of the temple is bound by the oath. You blind fools, which is greater, the gold or the temple that makes the gold sacred? You also say, if anyone swears by the altar, it means nothing. But anyone who swears by the gift on the altar is bound by that oath. You blind men, which is greater? The gift or the altar that makes the gift sacred. Therefore, anyone who swears by the altar swears by it and everything on it. And anyone who swears by the temple swears by, sw swears by it and by the one who dwells in it. And anyone who swears by heaven swears by God's throne and by the one who sits on it. And now Matthew 11, 28 through 30. Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy, and my burden, say it with me, is light. You may be seated. I had this new fangled expensive gadget in my pocket. I'll never forget it. 2012. It was this new piece of technology that I wasn't convinced that I needed, and now I can't live without it. Anybody remember your first iPhone? I was sitting, this was fine dining, I was sitting at a Chili's in suburban Chicago for lunch with friend Brian. He's a member of my church I started in Chicago. And as we were about five minutes into our chips and salsa and queso, which is really bad at Chili's, can we just all admit that? My pocket began to buzz. And if you ever seen like your grandpa get their first iPhone and it takes them forever to figure it out? Well, that was Jeff at the time, 34 years old, 35 years old. My phone is buzzing. I pull it out. I'm not quite sure how to open it. But I had a notification and it caught my eye. And I figured out how to open my phone. And the story from the news popped up. And there with my friend Brian, we began to share the details of the Sandy Hook shooting in Newtown, Connecticut. Do you remember where you were when you heard that news? Do you remember what you felt when you saw what took place? 20 elementary-aged children murdered. Six teachers murdered, 26 dead, and then a shooter who took his own 
life. Well, as often happens in the face of such senseless tragedy, and I think it's okay to put the word evil next to that, don't you think so? In the face of such evil and tragedy, people of faith began to show up and do what's right. What's Mr. Rogers say? Look for the helpers. There were people of faith in that community rallying together, encouraging, praying, being present, doing all they could to bring healing to such brokenness. And I began to hear stories from my colleagues in that area. And it was beautiful. Three or four days after the massacre, there was a community prayer service where faith leaders from different faith traditions and denominations all came together in their town square to pray and to lament and to grieve and to bring the best of their faith traditions to the table to be supportive to one another. I have tragically had to participate in more of those than I care to, but I know how powerful they can be when you see people from such diverse faith come together as one to ask for God's healing balm to be present to those that witness the murder of 20 children and six teachers. Even in pain, God has a way of showing up. Have you ever felt that in your life? Even in the midst of pain, God has a way of showing up. But even though God shows up in the midst of pain, sometimes the church can get in the way. We've been talking these last few weeks about bad religion. And the addendum to this story that you may not know about is an example. I'm not going to use any names and I'm not going to name the church. You can find it on Google if you want to because I don't want to pretend like I'm better than I am because I'm not. But there was one minister who came forward to participate in this faith service. There was one minister who showed up to pray in the tradition that he came from. There was one minister that stood there to offer support to a diverse community on a stage with people of different Christian traditions, of Muslim tradition, Jewish tradition, and he lost his job. He was disciplined by his bishop. His church revolted on him, and he finally got his credentials back when he stood up and apologized for acknowledging that there were people of faith outside of their church. I want you to let that sink in. What kind of faith punishes people for praying with hurting people? What kind of faith punishes people for praying with hurting people? As we do this five-week series on bad religion, my problem is not that I don't have enough material for five weeks. My problem is I have enough material for five years. And if we went around this room and told our story of how religion has broken us rather than bound us together, we would be able to, we'd never run out of content to preach on. Nothing quite hurts like church hurt, does it? Nothing quite hurts like church hurt. And if it makes your heart break, and it makes my heart break, I need you to know the Bible says it makes Jesus' blood boil. It makes Jesus' blood boil. The whole 23rd chapter of Matthew is Jesus looking church people in the eye and saying, get out of my way so I can help people. The whole 23rd chapter of Matthew, Jesus reaches back as if he is just a prophet in the Old Testament, standing in the center of the religious community and dropping bomb after bomb after bomb on their traditions that keep them from people rather than moving them towards people. Jesus starts seven times in seven paragraphs in the 23rd chapter with this one word. Woe! Let's go ahead and say it with me. Woe! Woe to you! Now this woe is not like when you're on the roller coaster. This woe is not like when you see something, a, a crazy thing on TikTok. I don't know what TikTok is, but I know everybody's all into it. Woe is a word of judgment. Woe is a word of confrontation. Woe means you better buckle up because Jesus is going to step on your toes and make you and I uncomfortable. In verse 13, he says, woe to you 
who shut the door of heaven in, in, in people's face. You keep yourself out and you keep other people out. You live your faith in such a way that it not only excludes you from God's blessing, you're keeping other people at arm's length from what God is doing in your life. Woe to you who drive other people away from God's love. Can I get an amen? amen. Woe to you. Verse 15, woe to you who travel land and sea to make one convert. And then what does Jesus say about that convert? We can say this in church, it's the Bible. You make them twice as much a child of, you can say it in church, twice as much a child as hell. I think our mission statement as Lindenwood should be, we promise to not make you a child of hell. That's our goal, that's our aim. But what Jesus is saying woe to is that you are worse off by joining their faith than not joining it at all. How harsh is that? But it's blunt and it's clear and it's true. Verse 16. You probably get lost reading this section like I did. Oaths and altars and temples and what you swear by and what's a real oath and what's not a real oath. Let me make it real clear for you what Jesus is confronting here. Loopholes. Do you ever find that those who draw the line of who is in and out in faith always find a way to include themselves? Do you ever find that those that draw the clear lines of who's in and who's out find a way to include themselves no matter what they're doing with their own lives that they think no one knows about? Jesus has harsh words to those that know how to bend the rules for themselves, but in place an impossibly high bar on other people. Say it with me. Woe to you, woe to you who teach the rules to others and bend the rules for yourself. Now, lest we get a little self-righteous in our woes, this is not to the crowds. This is to the leaders. This is to the preacher and the staff. This is to the elder and the deacon. This is to the one that shows up early to greet at the door. This is to the one that sacrificially prepares communion every Sunday for us. This is for the people that are at the center of the church. Do you consider yourself active in the faith? Read those woes to you, to you, and not project it onto someone else. Am I with you? Yeah. Are you with me? Yeah. I don't like it any more than you do, but it has the added burden of being true. Bad religion is not organized religion. Bad religion is church leadership run amok. Can I say that one more time? Bad religion is not organized religion. Bad religion is church leadership rung amok. But you see, leadership in God's church is not about your rights. It's about your responsibilities. Leadership in God's church is not about us getting what we desire. It's about our responsibility to bless, encourage, and lift up and serve all of God's people. All of God's people. You do a Google search for this. Look how many times the New Testament uses the word leadership, and then Google and look how many times the New Testament talks about servanthood. Five times you get the word leader, 37 times you get the word servant. And this is the same one that says, anyone that wants to follow me, take up your cross and follow. You see, it's not about our rights as active participants in the body of Christ. It is our, about our responsibilities to serve, to bless, to care, to welcome. Because hanging over us, those of us that want to be all in, two hands on the plow for the kingdom, is a woe to us who are an obstacle to unleashing God's compassion in this hurting world. God calls us to be a conduit not a barrier. I used to attend an event every summer called the Leadership Summit. It was at a huge church in Chicago. It was called a Leadership Summit. And I'll never forget, one of their keynoters got up 
and he was invited to come in. He was a high-profile Christian leader. He was someone whose books I had on my shelf. And in the 40 minutes he had allotted, he ripped the event to shreds. And he says, it disgusts me, myself included, that we'll put 10,000 people in this room for a leadership summit. But if I said this is a servanthood summit, all of you ministers would have sent your staff and your leaders, but not yourself. And I was like, oh my goodness. What do we rally to? Leadership or servanthood? Now, I will tell you, leadership is important. We all know this. But leadership that is not drenched in servanthood is not leadership. Leadership not drenched in servanthood is not leadership. I also attended a conference many years ago. They had seven pastors as the keynoters. It was a one-day event. Seven high-profile ministers. I heard a podcast a couple weeks ago that referenced this, and it broke my heart. I kind of knew it, but I'd never had someone state it so clearly. Of the seven high-profile published ministers with huge platforms and big steeples and better hair than Jeff, they all were put forward that day as examples for us. Of those seven, six of them are no longer in ministry because of abuse of power, inappropriate relationships, and creating a toxic workplace. I think they cared more about power than empowering. I think the church goes awry when we care more about power than empowering. The check mark I want God to put on my life is that I would care more about empowering than power. And my hope for you is that as you take up your cross and follow, you know it's not about your rights, it's about your responsibility of empowering the people that God would put in your path to bless. That is the call. It's not about power, it's about empowering. Bad religion is about power, good religion is about empowering other people to serve those that God puts in your path to bless. I had that driven home to me in the most concrete way I could imagine many years ago. Many years ago, I was the senior minister at First Christian Church in Keokuk, Iowa. It's a tiny little town in Iowa that you've never heard of. And I had followed my father as, that, as the pastor of that church. And through his hard work of 26 years of ministry there, I followed him and I took, we, we had a strong congregation and we grew even more. And it, it was an amazing experience to be completely transparent. And by the time that um, I'd been there for a couple of years, we were the third largest congregation in our denomination. One day I was sitting at my desk, and I'm not going to lie to you, I was looking over all the new people that had come, I was looked over all the new people that had joined, and whatever is um, the biblical word, or the unbiblical word for pride, is what I was feeling. It's like, man, we're doing really well, aren't we? We're doing really well, aren't we? Sitting at my desk, my door swung open, and it was my dad. My dad went from being the senior minister to, as he called it, the part-time minister of drinking coffee with old people. <laughs> Not a bad job. And he was good at it. He stayed out of my hair and let me lead. It was great. There was a joke in there somewhere. <laughs> and he came in, and he reached underneath my desk, and he grabbed my trash can. It's like, Dad, what are you doing? He said, well, you know, Harold, our janitor... He needed a couple days off. And so he didn't have any more time off. So I told him to not tell the business manager. I'd clock him in. And I'm going to do his job for a couple days. And don't you tell anybody about it either. And there was my dad. Taking out the trash. Cleaning the toilets. Vacuuming the sanctuary. And showing me what true servanthood was. Folks, you're going to serve somebody, aren't you? You're going to serve somebody. Who will you serve? 
The same Jesus who announces all of the woes to those that would stand in the way of someone reaching out to the reconciling love of God in Jesus Christ is the same one who gives the words, Come to me, all you who are weary and carrying heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. The message translation says it this way. Are you tired, worn out, burned out on religion? Come to me. Get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how I do it. You will learn the unforced rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me, and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Are you tired? Are you worn out? Are you burned out by religion? Come to Jesus, and he will give you rest. Let us give thanks this morning that our hope is not in our sinful leaders of the church like me, but our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' love and righteousness. Let us give thanks that we worship a God who did not slam the door in our face, but swung wide open the doors of heaven and invited all who desire to come to come and find rest. Let us give thanks that we believe in a God who crossed land and sea and heaven and earth to come and give his life so that we could recover life. And let us give thanks that we worship a God who does not manipulate, but invites us in to the unforced rhythms of grace that instill in us the life we were created for. I close with this. God's church needs more ushers and less bouncers. Let's serve people. Let's serve people into the kingdom. Would you pray with me, please? And now, oh God, we thank you that you have invited us to serve somebody to give ourselves away just as you gave your life away for us. Oh Lord, I pray for all of those who have had the door of heaven slammed in their face. I pray that they would find the healing balm that comes from following Jesus. Oh Lord, I pray this morning for all of those that are still bound up in their heart from the traditions of their past may they be able to recover the life that they were saved to live. And we pray for all of us, O oh God, that you would untangle our hearts so that we may 